So we're here at the Samsung Blogger Lounge uh, with the Watcha 2 uh, Burnt Ends show. Right. Tell me a little bit about how many years have you been doing this? So I've been to South by uh, for this is my fourth year at South by Southwest, and uh, I first came to South by uh, with the It Gets Better project, which was a project that I worked on uh, since the inception. And you know, since my time here, it's been great to meet with entrepreneurs, people in the LGBT space who really want to push equality further. And I've seen that evolve over the last four years to where we are today, uh, which is incredible. Personal question. Yeah. How does it feel different for you four years ago to today in terms of who you are, what you represent? Does it? Does, do you feel more part of the community and like the community is open in part because of what the work you've done? I, I definitely think the storytelling matters. Um, I mean, we, we had 50,000 user-generated videos as part of the It Gets Better project, and you know there there have been studies that show um, you know nine out of ten people in America know an LGBT person. And the fact that you know an LGBT person is, means you're more li likely to understand the issues that they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's discrimination or just understand that you know they want to love someone too and, and have that be official. And I, I want to go back to that number yeah. for a second. Fifty thousand is no, awesome. You should yeah. be really proud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. because for every person that took the time to make a video and then was brave enough to upload it and decide to participate, there must be what five x more that participated but didn't make a video, or right. 10x or 30x. Right. Yeah. And I, you know, it's a courageous move to um, make a video and make a video about something so personal to yourself. And I think a lot of uh, I talked to a lot of companies and uh, campaigns that want to do user generated video, and you can't do it all the time um, because you know the It Gets Better project was something that was so personal to people that when they made a video, they felt personally invested in the success of their video, and they wanted their video to be seen by many other people. And what you saw are people liking the videos on Facebook, on YouTube. We almost we had nearly 50,000 counselors to people who were watching these videos who would then respond back to the videos and say, you know, your story really resonated with me. Thanks for you know, saving me through this really tough time or even saving my life. We saw those in the comments. So I want to talk a little bit about the company. Yeah. So great campaign. You've understood the power of social and how it you know, galvanizes. Before we get into issues in general, talk about what the company does. Yeah, so I work at uh, Bully Pulp Interactive, and uh, we're based in uh, Washington, D.C. We also have a New York office, um, and we uh, help uh, campaigns, candidates, nonprofit organizations, and uh, companies make a difference. Um, we uh, work with, uh, with the largest digital marketer for the Democratic Party, um, and a lot of my work is also in the LGBT space, too. I still do some work with the Against Better Project, as well as helping out the human rights campaign, and you know, they had a banner year this year. And it was great to see um, you know, their chief marketing officer, Anastasia Koo, here at South by Southwest talk about their success with their marriage equality uh, project this year that we helped out on at Bully Pulpit. So it wasn't very long ago that LGBT issues were, were wedge issues in politics and that yeah. you could run by being the guy that would stop you know, the right. degradation of marriage or whatever you know, that phrase was they were using. That's changed. Talk yeah. about like where we are today. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it was 10 years ago when, we, you know, John Kerry was in Ohio and people were talking about God, guns, and gays. And that was going to be a major issue in the election, and it was. And just in, this, in these past 10 years, we've seen the support for marriage equality go from a minority of the population to 59% just in the past week uh, say that they support marriage equality, which is a new high. Um, and so what we're seeing on from like our campaigns that we worked on in 2012 and also our 2013 races with Terry McAuliffe in Virginia, you know, normally a candidate in Virginia would run away from those issues. Terry was straight on about how he was supporting marriage equality and he believed all, all love was equal. And so they promoted a lot of, um, of HRC's content on their Facebook page. They targeted LG, LGBT voters to get them out to vote. And it really you know, mobilized their base. So no, it went from being a wedge issue to a rallying cry. So, and that's been you know, tremendous for in a state like Virginia. It's, we're going to continue to see that uh, in this upcoming cycle and in 2016. All right, so hard question. Yeah. So, isn't there some argument say your work here is done? You've done it. It's all good. You can wrap up the tent and go home. It's all. If you've gone over fifty percent, it's not going to go back, is it? Probably not, because people are getting you know more engaged. 
Like, what, I, I what's think, the important role now? Yeah, I, I think the, the biggest challenge right now is we still have a very fragmented system. Um, you have certain states where you have marriage equality. And then, you know, the bottom line is it doesn't stop at marriage equality. Um, you can still get fired in more than two dozen states just for being gay. Um, there are so many other issues that affect the LGBT community as a whole um, that you know, people are going to have to continue to take a look at and continue to highlight that over the long term. And I think the key challenge for a lot of us uh, in the community is to not think that, oh, it's all over with equality. We have to keep the fight going with um, all the other issues within the LGBT community, and that's going to be difficult. So, 2014, really important year. Tell us something that you've seen that really inspired you out of South by. So I, I think it's uh, meeting so many people who work at organizations who are now investing in digital and digital as a priority and knowing the power of digital that can have in terms of creating social change. Um, you know, just a few years ago, I would have never expected to be working with the human rights campaign. Um, and, you know, that organization has really transformed over the past few years and harnessed the power of social media. And you saw it this past year with the Red Logo campaign. Uh, where millions of people change their, their logos on Facebook uh, to the, the red equal sign. Um, organizations like that who really understand that digital is a priority is something that inspires me to continue to work with more clients and people who also believe in that, in that same respect. Very cool. Alright, so as a fellow political yeah. uh, engaged person, let's talk about 2016. Yeah. Where does Hillary fit into the story? You know, I'm, I'm a little biased because I came off the Hillary campaign in 2008. Um, so I, I, you know, she's also from my, uh, she lives in my hometown of Chappaqua, New York. So I can only say great things about her. No matter what she decides, you know, I'm going to be at her, at her side helping her out in, in whatever capacity I can. Um, it's it's definitely just too early to, to talk about that. Fair though. enough. By the way, there's some debate about whether she really lives in Chapel Car or not, but she does not have a house in Chapel Car. She, she does, and you know, honestly, I've, you know, my parents have seen them around, and I've, I've talked to Bill, and he he, he runs around town, and uh, he he knows the neighborhood. You so. mean the pending first husband? Uh, uh, no comment yeah, on yeah, that, but I hope yeah. I hope so. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about let's wrap up and talk about South by for a second. Yeah, totally. So, what does it feel like for you here this year? What what what's the thing that you're going to take away from 2014 that really feels like something changed for you? Yeah, I, I think it's uh, the LGBT community reaching a wider audience, um, and that's always been my mantra uh, when I talk to clients about how we want to spread equality. We can't preach to the choir anymore, and that's why the It Gets Better project was so great because I worked with a lot of sports teams to to bring the message, uh, LGBT message, to the sports universe. Um, you know, just yesterday I was I was talking to George Takei, and um, he has a, a huge social following, and he's doing a lot of great work with AARP, um, but he's also bringing the message of marriage. With Quality to an older generation, which is incredible. 69% um, of millennials uh, support marriage equality, and I am not sure about the, the older generation, but it's much lower. Um, that's only going to climb as more people talk about marriage equality, more people you know, meet their friends and hear these stories of other people. So we got to keep the storytelling going, and I'm seeing that more and more at South by Southwest of our allies you know, rallying uh, in support of you know, uh, different LGBT people like Michael Sam, Jason Collins, um, and you know everyone else. Listen, I just want to say, on behalf of everyone in the tech community, I think you're doing amazing work. Congratulations! Right. Yeah. I'm really glad you're here. Thanks so much. And I just want to say, you know, thanks to everyone out there for sharing their story. Uh, keep on doing that because that's where we're going to push the needle. Indeed. Thanks. So, first thing, I started by asking everybody, how many years have you been coming to South by? Ah, so this is my third year here. How does it feel different to you this year? Are there things that seem you know? Surprising? I know there's I know there's the whole like South by used to be much more hip and cool and all that. Yeah, I think in the three years I've been here, it's been more or less the same as a program. I think the difference for me is the first year I came here, you know, I came down with my wife. It was basically vacation. We were hanging out with friends. It was fun. Like last year. I started to have like some responsibilities, but mostly I was like crashing on some friends' couches and helping them with their, their businesses. This year, like, we threw a big party with Capital Factory, we're hosting a lounge, we have five panels, like, it's like a, a business operation. So I think my, my, what I'm getting out of South By has probably improved, but my enjoyment of South By is probably less than it was like year one when it was just chill and awesome.
So 1776 clearly has meaning. It's yeah. not the street address of the building, I assume. It is not. Talk about where that name came from and what it means. So, so 1776 is an incubator that focuses on you know, startups that are tackling grand challenges in areas like education, health, energy, transportation, city government stuff. Um, so the name of the, um, of the, if it comes from the Declaration of Independence, right? Signed in 1776. So there's like the passage, and I'm gonna paraphrase, but it basically goes, when institutions no longer serve the needs of the people, it's the duty of the people to rise up and create new institutions. And that was sort of the entire concept and ethos of 1776 that like, we can't wait for government to fix these problems. We need to go out and build the, the new ideas, the new technologies, the new business models that are gonna solve these challenges for us. So I haven't yet asked the question of Hugh Paharis, but I will, which is how did Snowden get here? Did he raise his hand and say, I'd like to stop by and give a talk or? I have, I have no idea. But it's very timely and a lot Extremely of conversations timely. about privacy and yeah. about the rights of data and about where data plays in, in the social commerce of our life. Um, it seems to me that that's your sweet spot. Oh yeah, I mean we were discussing that even just this morning, right? So I did a panel this morning with um, Congressman Fahrenthold from Texas and uh, uh, somebody from, from who helped to build Zipcar, somebody who's building an electric motorcycle company, like it was all in transportation. And one of the biggest issues you get into is so we're making our lives better and better from a transportation standpoint. We have more modalities, we know exactly where our Uber is, all this stuff. But oh my God, are there more and more and more private companies and governments and private companies and governments who know where we are at every moment, right? Like, you know, it's the old idea that it's not so much that our privacy like disappears because of some grand conspiracy, but incrementally we keep, we want each next innovation that helps to do it. And I think it's, it's going to be one of these central issues in terms of technology and policy, not just for the next year or two or three years, but I think for this whole generation. I'll give you an example. I'm so frustrated with passwords, I'm begging people to take my fingerprint. Yeah. Please, God, I know it's terrible, and I know I shouldn't want to do that, but all I want is my right. phone to make the horrible password nightmare end. Yeah, but right. you, every time, every convenience we get like that, right, incrementally empowers people who could potentially do things we don't want with that data. Yeah. And I think it's a, you know, it's not so simple as to just say, you know, it's government's issue to fix or, wow, it's, it's those evil big companies. It, it, it really is a broad societal question about exactly what, what is the right trade-off. Okay, so now I'm really puzzled because I thought you were gonna be an interesting conversation and you're even more interesting than that. <laughs> Most of the guys I know in finance are secretly just bankers. Right. They put on a, 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 a hoodie or sneakers or something, but they're mostly, you're clearly more than that. Um, you know, I did, I did uh, it's, it's funny, right? Because I've, I've been a serial entrepreneur. I, I started my first company when I was 18, right out of high school. Um, you know, I've been through successes, I've been through failures, I've gone through the whole journey multiple times. Um, you know, and fundamentally, I, I you know, I view it from a, a geek standpoint, right? Like solving problems and, and, and building great business models. Um, you know, 1776 was really the, the sort of culmination of this idea that like, you know, if we're going to tackle all these issues, what's the, the most important thing I can do to do that? And it was ultimately about this idea of being a catalyst to bring new and different networks together. So how do you combine the innovators together with the people that can help to fund them? How do you, how do you combine them together with the people that can really help them to navigate a lot of these regulated industries and these policy areas in this sense that like, uh, I'm gonna do an awesome solution for transportation, it involves dealing with government and that's just awful so I won't do it. It's like, look, there are strategies you can do to do that. And so for me it, was, it really was like, how do you build an entirely new community so all these different people can help each other do great things? So the question we've been asking everyone is what inspires you? What are the things that you see here that make you go, I wanna, I wanna, that, that makes me wanna work harder and try harder. All of this inspires me, right? Like I'm born and raised in Washington, D.C. I mean, I, I've traveled all around the world. I lived in Europe for five, six years, but I ultimately came back to Washington, D.C. because I believe it is a place that actually has the potential to solve big issues. But it's not going to be because the traditional Washington power structures suddenly wake up and go, aha, we're going to become innovative, move fast, do all this stuff. It's going to be because the kinds of people you see around here, right, the, the incredible creative people, the, the ones who, who see these problems and want to tackle them, right, all of them decide that, you know, photo sharing apps are awesome, but we really, really need to figure out healthcare. We really need to figure out education. We really need to figure out 
like water management, right? Issues that seem boring, but we really need to figure these things out for the, the, the future of our children, our children's children, and everything we, we say as a people we want to believe in. So I work in New York and I've grown yeah. up in New York and watching the open data initiatives in New York, yeah. fuel innovation has been so exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Like you take this thing we own, which is the data that our government makes because it's our government and you give it to entrepreneurs and they make awesome things incredible with things, it. Yeah. yeah, incredible things. And you know, it's funny because like the first wave of it, you know, of all the open government data stuff was kind of like, hey, here's some spreadsheets with some data on it, do stuff. But as, as it's really matured, I think, you know, particularly city governments, have gotten much more sophisticated about releasing this stuff in, in machine readable ways that you can actually work with and, and opening up services and not just data sets. But I think the entrepreneurs have also, you know, it's not just sort of the open gov hacktivist community. Now you're starting to be somebody going, I don't care at all about open gov, I just want to solve an education related problem. But to do that, I need to understand student test scores in an anonymized way, yeah. right? And I need access to that data set. And I think that's what gets really powerful is when people stop even talking about open government data and they just start assuming that if you need access to data that ultimately the taxpayers paid for, you can use that in your app. So last question. It feels to me like 2014 is going to be remembered as the year at South by where politics and activism and technology came together. Does that? I think, I think that's happening. I think you can feel it at South by, but I think it's happening across many, many different venues, right? Um, because I think you're starting to, you know, the Valley is, is wanting to take on a lot of these big challenges, right? Um, Washington, D.C. is recognizing that so much of the policy landscape is being rapidly shaped by issues they don't appreciate and understand. And I think there's a lot of entrepreneurs that are starting to look at this stuff and go, we've done unbelievable stuff in the consumer half of our economy, right? What we can do with our cell phone, what we can do with faith, it's mind boggling, right? What we could do 10 years ago. But there's still aspects of being a citizen that are deeply, profoundly frustrating and dangerous, right? And, and so I think you see all of that brew starting to come together. And, you know, for me, 95% of it is just trying to get everybody to speak the same language. You know, I'll tell you an anecdote, right? I was, I was at uh, dinner last night with, a, with a, um, a venture capitalist friend. And he said, we don't invest in anything that has regulatory risk. There's enough other risk in building a company. We don't want to deal with that. And I said, oh, okay. And he goes, well, there was one company we invested in. You know, it's doing drones. Right, so they, they fly around and they take three-dimensional pictures of everything and use it for artificial intelligence purposes. And I went, well, that, that sounds to me like there's an awful lot of regulatory risk involved in that company. the FAA probably cares about that. And he goes, oh, no, no, it, it's all going to be fine there because the U.S. would never be so silly as to implement a policy that would prevent us from leading in drone technology and cede that to Europe and Asia. And I went, you know, it's fascinating like, because as a Washingtonian, you just you cringe when you hear stuff like this because you're like, wow, your faith in the rational, like the rationality of the policy right. process, totally far outstrips mine. You should FedEx him a copy of uh, House of Cards. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right, but that's the point. Like, great, we all know, we're all looking at drones yeah. and we're going, we're looking at self driving cars, we're looking at, like, totally blowing apart the traditional ways we educate our kids. There's no way that can be done without our innovative startups. There's no way the startups can do all of that without smashing right into government, right? Dude, it's a pleasure to talk to awesome. you. Awesome. Hey, great to see you. Thank great you so time. much. Bye. So, education. I hear nothing going on, really sleepy, it's, tired, it's rocking, right? To totally, totally dead. No, um, <laughs> no it's, uh, it's moving really fast, and when you come down to South By, you really... You really get to see all that all that seismic change that's happening, not only just in higher ed where 2U is, but impacting all the way down to kindergarten and even preschool. And to see how how education and industry that typically does move slow is just being disrupted so much in so many different angles. And it's amazing because you know so many um, when industry gets disrupted, you tend to think that a lot of different people are competing against each other to for a share of that disruption. But in education, there's so many different angles that we can kind of all coexist and really impact uh, on a fundamentally change education as a whole.
Washington. So, so explain to you for, for the novice. Yes. I mean, big, big relationships, right? Yes. With real institutions. Yes. Bi yes, absolutely. We are 100% outcomes driven, right? So we're not, uh, we are really focused on the quality of our, of our programs because when you partner with, so to your partners with uh, the top universities in the country, right? The UC Berkeley, UNC Chapel Hill, Georgetown University. When you partner with these schools, these schools have built a brand over 200 years that are some of the most respected institutions in the country. And they've been focused on quality for 200 years. We have to take that, uh, take that into consideration. And that's why all of our outcomes are driven on, on quality. So what we do is we go in and we partner with their grad, uh, graduate uh, schools and we build the entire infrastructure and build their online grad programs. And so they deliver, so they're able to be delivered with the same faculty, the same curriculum, and the same degree, but now delivered on a global scale to thousands of students rather than just the, you know, just a small, uh, small classroom. And then taking that one step further in terms of quality, uh, it's such an, it, it's, while it's uh, a larger scale, the classroom is more intimate. Uh, there's no back row, if you will, because everybody's on screen, on video with one another, uh, kind of like a Brady Bunch effect. Washington. So here's the thing I'm confused about. Yep. You may not know this, but last week was South by Southwest EDU. Yes. But yep. you're here this week during Interactive. So yep. what are you doing here? So here I focus on uh, marketing and strategic partnerships. I'm really looking to figure out how we can grow our programs through um, some exciting and creative uh, you know, marketing partnerships and figure out how we can continue to innovate with the programs that we already have. Um, I did go to South by uh, EDU last year. It was amazing to see like I, like I referenced earlier, the change that's happening all, all through K through 12. But when it comes to the innovative partnerships and, and everything like that, uh, that's here, that's right now, and uh, that's what I have fun with. I, I'm also a social good entrepreneur, so it's, it's, a, it's a nice double dip for me, if you will. So, so take your two you hat off for a second yep. and put your education thinker hat on. Yeah. We get in a time machine, we go forward five years, 10 years. 15 years, what's it going to look like? When, when the music stops and we really are at the next chapter in education, yeah. what's it going to look like? Washington. The underground experience as a freshman is something that you'll never get, right? Any, anywhere else. You can't get that online. Uh, but uh, there clearly does have to be a supplement to that experience uh, that makes it more accessible, that makes the, uh, the education richer um, because like we said, like education traditionally or the, at least the public perception is slow moving. Uh, we need, but now it's moving fast, right? And that needs to be supplemented. So whether it's through uh, online courses for credit, which to you uh, does do through semester online, or whether it's uh, schools partnering with like the general assemblies of the world to get new professors in, new ideas uh, moving forward, I think that that's a really important piece. Um, so in terms of five to 10 years, I think that that's really what you're going to see is how these things are affecting the undergraduate education, not just the graduate. And I think that there's going to be, uh, there's still going to be to you. There's still going to be, you know, our competitors. Uh, I think that there will still be MOOCs, um, but I think that it's going to be more blended towards moving towards us, where they are for credit, where they do have a higher, more intrinsic value for the student. Uh, because right now, unfortunately, uh, MOOCs have such a low completion rate. But I think that that is going to change because I think the schools will figure it out. And it's important that they do. Last question. Yep. You're here at South by, it's 2014. It's been a really interesting year. What's, what, what do you take away as an inspiration? What's been the wow. thing that, that's really going to echo? If I sit to you in six months, what do you remember? What's the thing? Wow, that's a, that's a great question. And, you know, it might just be that I was here earlier, but I think... Uh, wearables have been the talk of the town this year, right? The jawbones, and, and I just sat in on a panel uh, with uh, strategic for or partnership for um, for public health for for the country, and it was amazing to. They're not just building these products to just give you something cool to wear or just so you can, uh, you know, uh, work out a little bit more and share it with people. They're really doing it because they see a. A problem with with this country, and that you know that uh, one third, it, one out of three kids is obese, right? And that all of these wearable technologies and all these innovations in health is really uh, solving a fundamental problem. And for me, totally aside from to your education, uh, I love seeing when technology is applied for real change, um, and it's being implemented on a, a 
across the, across the spectrum, and companies are able to uh, are able to do well uh, by doing good. Right, they're able to succeed by still doing good and still serving a, uh, a bigger issue. So overall, uh, I love seeing how education continues to impact these sectors and really on a fundamental level. And I think that that was something last year that was starting. It's on a whole nother level this year. Dude, pleasure to meet See, you. Absolutely, really cool. thank you.